Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. Today we'll be looking at sections 5.3 and 5.4 dealing with enthalpy. Um, many reactions in everyday life occur at essentially constant atmospheric pressure and conditions. When you look at the different chemical reactions that might be happening in the picture that you see here, or even the physical reactions of the evaporating water and the condensing water vapor in the air in the, the picture down below, what you need to realize is these are open to outside atmospheric pressure. Um, so while those reactions are occurring, really atmospheric pressure isn't changing. So most reactions that are happening around us in open containers are actually occurring under constant pressure. And that plays a role in our concept of enthalpy. Now these reactions can result in heat absorbed or released or work that is done on the system or by the system. And remember, this goes back to what we looked at yesterday with internal energy. When you're talking about energy changes, energy changes can, form, come, can come in the form of heat or can come in the form of work. Now, the work component. Usually in an open container, the only work that's being done by the gas is really the, the pushing on the surroundings by that gas as the reaction occurs. Or sometimes by the, the surroundings pushing on the gas itself. Now, when you look at the situation over here, I've got the initial state type situation, and as the reaction occurs, if I make gas particles, those gas particles are going to push up on the surroundings, and that's going to cause the piston, in this case, to rise. This type of work is what's known as pressure volume work, because what really happened here, the system did work on that piston, causing it to rise up in the air. Now, from the system's point of view, with what we looked at yesterday, this would be a negative value for work because the system was expending that energy on the surroundings to move that piston up in the air. So that's what I mean by the typical uh, reaction that creates gases, those gases push up on the surrounding atmosphere. That's actually a form of work, and it's what's known as pressure volume work. The pressure really times the change in volume. Now, we can measure the work done by the gas if the reaction is done in a vessel that has been fitted with a piston, kind of what I showed in the last situation. Now, as that piston goes up, there's an increase in the volume, and the pressure pushing down on that piston is the exact same. So the work done by the system would be the pressure, that's the force in essence over area that that gas is fighting against when it pushes that piston up in the air, times the change in volume, because obviously when it increases the volume more, it's pushed the piston farther. So this would be a way to measure the work that's done by those gases. Now notice it's negative P delta V, and that negative sign is a reminder that from the system's point of view, when that volume is increasing, when that piston is being pushed up, it's negative in terms of the work that that system is doing on the surroundings. So it would be a negative W value in our internal energy equation. Now, if it process takes place at constant pressure, as the majority of processes that we study do, the only work that's being done is the pressure volume work of any potential gases that get created. And we can account for heat flow during the process by measuring what's called the enthalpy of the system. That would be the heat flow basically at constant pressure. So enthalpy is, um, is the internal energy plus the product of the pressure and the volume, because remember that's our work component. So when we're looking at um, internal energy, it would be our heat component plus our work component. So when we're looking at our heat component, which is what H is going to deal with here in a second, H is related to heat at constant pressure, then H would equal E plus PV. Now when the system changes at constant pressure, the change in enthalpy, which is called delta H, would be the quantity of E plus PV and it's how much that quantity is changing. So it's the change in the quantity of E plus PV. And this can be rearranged and written as delta H, which is the change in enthalpy of the system, would then equal the change in internal energy plus the P delta V. Now remember from a few seconds ago, since the change in energy is Q plus W, actually what we talked about yesterday, and from a few seconds ago, work is actually negative P delta V, we can substitute these into the enthalpy expression, and what we get is, instead of delta E, we're going to have Q plus W, and instead of P delta V, that's our negative W, because W equals negative P delta V. Well, you'll notice the work components here cancel, and what we're left with under constant pressure conditions is the change in enthalpy equals Q. And this is something that we discussed last year. Now, mathematically, none of these are equations you're going to have to do any calculations with, but you should, under, should understand this fundamental relationship right here.
for the reactions that we're going to be studying. So reactions at constant pressure, Q is the same as the change in enthalpy. So at constant pressure, the change in enthalpy is the heat gained or lost by the system. Now, one final step I want to take this on. Because the P delta V for most of the reactions that we're looking at is very small, the actual amount of work done by gases pushing up in the outside environment, and one, you have to have gases actually produced. If not, then that component's going to be zero. But typically, even if our gas is produced, it's a very small value. So for all intents and purposes, we can often look at the change in enthalpy to determine the change in internal energy. So if the work component is basically zero, then delta E really is the same as Q. And if we're at constant pressure, then that's also the same as delta H. So enthalpy change is really the heat at constant pressure. And it's often the same thing as the change in internal energy. Now, you may remember from last year, so this is just a quick review of ideas, processes can be either endothermic or exothermic. When you're endothermic, that means your delta H is positive because heat is going into the system. So when heat goes into the system, your final enthalpy is greater than your initial enthalpy. So your change in enthalpy, final minus initial, would end up being a positive value. So anytime heat is going into the system, delta H is positive. And on the flip side, when heat is leaving the system, that's exothermic, and that would be a negative value from the system's point of view. Now, the next section gets into enthalpies of reactions, and a number of your homework problems are going to deal with this concept. Once you make the connections, it's really not too bad, but there's a few connections you really need to make about reactions and the energy of those reactions. Now, the change in enthalpy delta H is the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants should look familiar. We talked about state functions are always final minus initial. Well, enthalpy and enthalpy change are also state functions. What you see here on the right is an energy diagram uh, dealing with the enthalpy change. We're going to take a look more closely at that as a second. All I really want to mention here at this point is in this enthalpy diagram, the direction of the arrow is showing you what's reactants and products. Notice on this side, the arrow is going down. That means these would be your reactants and these would be your products when your enthalpy change of this reaction is negative 890, when it's exothermic. In this side, the arrow goes up. That means these are the reactants, and those would be the products. And when that happens, you've got an endothermic reaction to the tune of positive 890 kilojoules of energy. We're going to come back to enthalpy diagrams or energy diagrams and the nature of reversible reactions and energy in a few minutes. One thing I want you to fundamentally understand is that the quantity delta H, which is called the enthalpy change, is usually we're looking at it, the enthalpy change of a particular reaction. So we typically call it the enthalpy of reaction or the heat of reaction. And it's symbolized looking like this. Now there's different types of reactions we study. So if we actually know the type of reaction, we can plug that in for this value. So sometimes we'll talk about enthalpies of combustion or enthalpies of formation or a number of different types of enthalpies, enthalpies of fusion and so forth. So if we know what type of reaction we're discussing, instead of saying the delta H of reaction, we say the delta H of combustion or fusion or whatever. Now the reaction we're looking at here is an example of a combustion reaction. It's also a formation reaction. We're forming the substance water from its constituent elements here. So this type of heat of reaction, we could call it combustion reaction, or we could call it a heat of formation. But for this reaction, the delta H is negative 483.6. Now you need to make a connection between what's happening here and what that sign means and how that would reflect in an energy diagram. So here's our equation that we're looking at. It says it's exothermic. Negative 483.6 kilojoules is given off when that reaction occurs. Well, one thing I want to remind you about, and this is something we talked about last year, this is writing this reaction with the energy outside of the equation. We could also include that energy inside the equation. Since it's exothermic, that would mean energy is given off as a product. So I could also put this energy right here, plus 483.6 kilojoules. When that reaction happens, as is listed, two moles plus one mole making two moles, you also read 483.6 kilojoules of energy. So whenever you see a negative value in your delta H, remember that's exothermic, that would mean energy is a product. If this were a positive value, that would mean energy would be written on the reactant side. So in order for this reaction to happen, 483.6 kilojoules of energy would have to be added to our hydrogen and our oxygen. 
So depending on what the sign is of our heat of reaction, that really tells us whether it's endothermic, exothermic, and it also tells us where energy is involved in the reaction. Is it going in as a reactant or coming out as a product? Now the other connection I want you to see with this is what's happening with this diagram right here. And we'll look at this a little bit more in a second as well. But notice we've got reactants at the start of our arrow. So right here the arrow is going down, so our reactants are up here. And since we're losing energy as a system, when we go to our products, which are down here, notice we've gone downhill. We're lower in enthalpy. And that's exactly what that negative means. So you should be able to make a connection between an enthalpy diagram or energy diagram and the heat of reaction. You should be able to say, yeah, this is a valid or a not a valid energy reaction for the reaction being specified. Now, what this equation really tells us is for every two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen, 483.6 kilojoules is released to the surroundings when the water is formed. That meant it's also a product, which we looked at a second ago. Now, since this reaction is balanced, it specifies states, and it includes energy, this is a form of a thermochemical equation. If I wrote this energy in the equation by putting plus 483.6 kilojoules, that would also be a thermochemical equation. Still balanced, still includes energy, and it still includes states. And the reason why we have to specify states is because it's all about the energy. When we're dealing with states, energy is different when we're dealing with different states. H2O gas is higher in energy than H2O liquid is. So if we're talking about liquid H2O versus gaseous H2O, that's a bigger difference in energy between our gas and our liquid. So thermochemical equations need to specify states because they matter to the energy. Now, energy diagrams and enthalpy diagrams. Enthalpy diagrams are used to represent what's happening with enthalpy changes in an associated reaction. Now, in this particular case, remember, the reactants have to be where the start of the arrow is. The products have to be where the arrow is going. And you have to put your reactants and products in appropriate relation to each other by energy based upon the enthalpy change of the reaction. Since this is exothermic and negative value, it has to be going downhill. So this would be a valid enthalpy diagram for this particular reaction. And we could even be more specific. This just, just, says, just, just, just says delta H is less than zero. We could also say that delta H actually equals negative 483.6 kilojoules. That is less than zero, and that's what the actual amount would be. So that's really what that distance represents between those two, is that much enthalpy change, that much energy change. Now, your book mentions there's a few things you should fundamentally understand about enthalpy because they have an effect in when we're, when we're looking at different types of reaction situations. The first, enthalpy is an extensive property. Do you remember that? It means extensive. It depends upon amount. So the more chemicals we have reacting, the more energy is going to be involved. And that's a mathematical situation that we can ex exploit in some thermochemistry stoichiometry. We never get away from stoichiometry in AP. Second relationship, and this is one you should remember from last year. The enthalpy change for reaction of in the forward direction is equal in size, but opposite in sign to the enthalpy change of the reverse. And this is something we saw slides ago when we were looking at that first reaction that was mentioned. It was a negative when we went to one direction, and it was positive when we went the other direction. Same amount, so same magnitude, opposite sign. The third relationship you should understand about enthalpy is it depends upon the states of the reactants and products. And that's why we have to specify them in thermochemical equations. One of the few times all year you really have to specify state is if it says write a thermochemical equation because the energy of gaseous particles are different than the energy of liquid particles. So state matters. Now, the math problem I wanted to look at here, and you're going to look at and use this in various ways in the homework for this chapter, how much heat is released when 4.5 grams of methane gas is burned at constant in a constant pressure system? So basically, it's burned in an open air situation, a constant pressure situation. Now, this is a thermochemistry stoichiometry. So since it's stoichiometry, what do we need to write? What do we need to have? That's right, you need a balanced equation. So the very first thing we need to start with here is the equation that we're talking about. And we really, if we're going to look at energy as it's involved in the thermochemical equation, we need the energy too. It's not enough to have the balanced equation. We need to know how much energy. Now this is something at this point that has to be specified for you because we haven't looked at how you can actually calculate that at all. But what we're going to look at is how if this is actually a part of the reaction, it's a part of any stoichiometry we can do with the reaction. 
Now, you may notice this may be different than the reaction you got in your own notes. Make sure you're writing this reaction down because we're talking about methane burning here. Now, math-wise, we've got 4.50 grams, remember from last chapter. Whenever you have grams, you can get to moles. Well, if you know moles of one substance, you can get to moles of any other substance, including the energy in the reaction. Because for every one mole, because that's what this is, one mole of methane burning, that's going to involve exactly that much energy. So we can go from moles of ethane to energy, just like we can go from moles of ethane to or methane to moles of oxygen, moles of carbon dioxide, moles of water. We can also go into moles of energy. So this is the type of problem you'll often be doing mathematically. Remember, what we have here is stoichiometry. You're going from one substance to another. In this, in this case, the substance, so to speak, quote unquote, that we're looking at is energy of a reaction. And that ends our second set of notes over thermochemistry.